Who's in the house? Vocab is in the house. Vocab, coming on you like a meat slab, coming out of rehab. He's about to grab your mind, find the time to find some rhymes, because I'm sublime. Let's interview this bro, because he's a slam poet, and I slam poeted for you. That was the connection of what just happened. And he, uh, very specifically, he, uh, he street, ev not evangelizes, apologetic sizes with, uh, what is it? Black Hebrew Israelite something? These, this, these guys? Yes. We're talking to Vocab Malone, who uh, evangelizes to black Hebrew Israelites. <laughs> Is that the right? Hebrew Israelites. Hebrew Israelites. Well, some of them, yeah, they use quote black. There's some that are like, like you're only like Israelite if you're black or something. And so there's all these different kinds. So he goes he around, talks about he goes around like downtown Phoenix and argues with them. Yeah, he's got all these videos. And he's and, like uh, debating them and, and it shows like Street Fighter and it's like, rah, 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 rah. defeated. And if you've seen this podcast before where we had Jeff Durbin on, he works with them. Yeah. So they'll, they'll, they'll go uh, tag, yeah, like that. tag team and beat up and street. rap street battle some uh, atheists. And we did a little, little uh, slam poetry together. And then since his name is Vocab, we actually threw some brand new words at him and made him come up with definitions. And that was a blast. This is kind of a really interesting topic. I hadn't really heard anything about yeah. these guys before. If you saw the Covington kids that had that uh, Native American guy that was banging the drum, he's one of these guys that thinks that he's was like the, the Native Amer was the guys that are Was the Native American one of them? Well, I think like Native Americans can be Hebrew yeah. Israelites because because then all those like militaristic looking guys yeah. around yeah, those were them yeah. So anyway, sunglasses, berets, and stuff. Okay. It's kind of an interesting topic, and it's a really I guess it's a lot more widespread than I had realized. So if you want some good information on Hebrew Israelites and you want to hear some crazy rap battles and slam poetry slam battles poetry and battle, yeah. learn some new words, this is your show. This is the show for you. If you're in that cross section of the three people who are interested in all of those things. Have you found your video? Oh, have you? Oh, have you? Here we go. All right, Mr. Malone. Can I? Do you go, Mr. Malone, or is that you have to say it all one? Like it's a rapper named Vocab Malone. I'm okay either way. Either way, okay. So, Mr. Malone, um, you, this guy rap battles Black Hebrew Israelites. Is that yeah. correct? Street I don't think I've done any rap battles, but apologetic battles on the streets. Mm. Yes, although a friend of mine who is a Christian rapper <clears throat> did do a response track to a diss track they did to us once. Okay. A response track to a diss track. Okay, I got it. Yeah, they, That's they like uh, had track inception. Tra yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, the, they did this diss track, which is slanderous, and then we did a response. One of our guys did a response. It was actually factual-based. They never mm. responded. Hmm. Wait, so they actually did a rap diss track? Against you guys, the Black Hebrew Israelites did this? Yeah, yeah. They called me a Malibu's most wanted in it. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? Uh, like a good uh, nickname. I mean, yeah. if you get dissed by someone and they have a really good diss, you kind of got to respect that, right? Yeah, I guess it's like that current TikTok meme. It's like, listen, it's it's a good joke. It's and a great crying, joke yeah. even, but I need you to stop. Or Sadly, I know what he's talking about. You do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you're crying and saying it's a good joke. Yeah, some lady but, would. Um, yeah, that's the thing. I, that's good. That's it seems thing. like maybe the youth are starting to realize that like there's there is a level of respect in joking with each other, or or even like a, a good diss. You know, a little less sensitive. Is that good? Is that a good direction or no? Uh, so a lot of Hebrew Israelites are definitely of the dish it out, can't take it type. Okay. So a diss where they, uh, you know, they accuse one of my buddies of uh, picking up prostitutes during his work, you know, which he, he doesn't that, 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 just to say, because he's a truck driver, it's just something to say. Right. Oh, so he's not, a, but then we'll respond back uh, about, about factual things that they actually have said or done mm -hmm. and all oh, it's, it's off limits. That, that was, that it's, uh, it's offensive and all that. So, <laughs> uh, it'd be great if it was a two way street, but with most of these guys, it's not a two way street. So you have like a serious, like, uh, it's like a Hatfield McCoy thing going on with these black Israelites. Well, they actually would say that theologically. Okay. They would say this is Jacob versus Esau being played out in the 21st century. They would actually say that, except they would say it's the Edomites versus the Semites. So can you, for or context, actually for Edomites versus Israelites. Let's sorry. just go like people that have no idea, which was mostly me until I started looking into your stuff. Yeah. You don't know a lot about the black Israelites or all the different Israelites. There's all these people that are identifying as Israelites. Is that the basic idea? 
Yeah. Um, like they're not they from th- Israel, right? Uh, well, some of them some, moved to Israel. Some of them okay. moved to Israel, but it's it's different than, of course, being from Israel. If but you what moved they, what, to Israel, are you an Israelite at that moment? Well, you're like an Israeli. America? You're an Israeli. You're an Israeli. Okay. There's a group called the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem. Okay. And uh, they came out of the south side of Chicago in the 60s. And first they went to West Africa. It didn't work out, even though the guy had a vision kind of saying that's where they're supposed to go. Ended up going to Israel during this right of return craze or phase when it was kind of hotter and uh israel kind of didn't know what to do with them because they're like mm-hmm. we well, haven't really officially converted but you're saying you are israelis but you want to live here but we don't want to be a racist it was a whole thing and eventually uh they settled and became really uh, productive members of society started joining idf and you know o- opening restaurants and, and contributing uh, culturally and artistically and all this stuff Recently, there's been a flare up. This is in the news right now where there's about 50. The numbers change depending on the story. Folks that Israel's trying to deport out of the community. And it has to do with him, them having a current lack of papers. It's not like they're deporting all 5000 of the African Hebrew sites of Jerusalem out of Demona, but they are deporting some of them. And uh, it's, it's kind of a messy story. Doesn't really make anyone look good. But, uh, you know, that's what's going on in that story. So it's actually current. But my point is some do move, but that's, that's a minority. In fact, <laughs> I'm going to tell you this and you're going to think, well, we shouldn't take this serious, but you should take it serious because even okay. bad ideas can grow. But listen, some Hebrew Israelites claim Jerusalem is in Africa. And so they would never move back to that land because they didn't believe not only has an identity switch happened, but actually a geographical location has switched and when people are mistaken to think that it's where it is now it's actually on the probably the west coast of africa is the usual theory uh, there's there's videos about this some hmm. prominent hebrews lights like the group called the end of the world ministries t-e-o-t-w they're one of the big proponents about it the end of the world ministries oh. mm-hmm. yeah i think they're twin i think they're twin brothers but they know they never show their face but it appears they're twins kind of like you know guys. which is which yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so okay so how did you get into this uh street apologetics with these guys yeah, like this what, is what made you target this or, feels like an incredibly specific uh, yeah it's really area specific. of interest it is i believe in specialization i think specialization can breed expertise and i think we need that it's kind of like if you look at the history of baseball you know pitch that complete game now it's hey come in for one and a half inning in the middle to face a couple of lefties and then you, you you get your million bucks meaning an increase in specialization right my point is in urban apologetics sometimes people think oh urban apologetics that's a specialization within apologetics proper it's culturally contextual but within urban apologetics there's all kinds of things that need to be dealt with one of them hebrew israelites the way i got into it was from street evangelism uh i started running into them and I started uh, looking into it more and more and realized there wasn't a lot of resources. Next thing I know, I was down the rabbit hole. So you sound like Ray Comfort and you're like, gosh, we need to jazz this up a little bit. Go a little well, more street. Uh, it wasn't like that. I mean, so I was in Bible college and we had to do internship hours. But that's why I went to the Bible college. So it's not a complaint. It's part of why I went to the school. And uh, one of the guys was leading the ministry going out to Arizona State. Right. And so uh, I went out with him and I done a little bit, but not quite like he was doing it. And when I was out there, I realized I liked what they were doing, but I wanted to do more. I want to have longer conversations. I wanted to utilize a little bit of hip hop in my discussions with people. These were, you know, college students. So one guy, you know, he's a Taoist for a week, you know, the neo atheists were out there, right? All of that kind of stuff going on. Occasionally there's a mosque down the street. Sometimes the Muslims would even come out and, and uh, walk around and talk. Anyways, it's Mill Avenue. People in Arizona know what I'm talking about. Well, uh, that's how it began. And I, and I eventually started doing kind of my own street evangelism where I would take mainly people from a Christian hip hop background out into the street and do a lot more specialized aiming at people in hip hop culture. And it just happened to be around the time when eight mile came out. So when people saw ciphering, they're like, Oh, look, it's guys rapping in the circle, just like even a man in eight mile. And so they would come over and check us out and we're spitting the gospel like we always had, but actually gave it a massive increase to what we were doing. Can you do time, that voice? Was, can you do that voice one more time? For us? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of my, cause I think of like a, a young Becky as they might say doing that. And then, you know, she has her, like her pumpkin spice and she's like, Oh, look at the guys are rapping like me rapping or whatever. So they come over <laughs> and we're spitting the gospel. So our crowds grew. Da, 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 da. 
but over time I switched places and started doing stuff at first Friday, big art walk type thing here in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And they're running all kinds of things. And eventually I sh the Hebrew Israelites started showing up in my neighborhood. And uh, so I started engaging them and um, I didn't know people were going to be so interested in it. I didn't know people were going to have so many questions, but they did. And if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see a lot of videos of like vocab versus Hebrew Israelites and it'll be street videos. When I first approach them, I try to have it be friendly if possible. And that's my favorite kind where we can have a jovial exchange of ideas. But a lot of times that's difficult to accomplish with, with some of the groups. All right. So beliefs wise, what, what is the main difference between BHI and like, they don't uh, like, they don't like the term black in front of their no. religion. Okay. And they would say, it's not even a religion. It's a culture. Right. But uh, of course it's a religion. It's a relationship. <laughs> it's a relationship. <laughs> yeah, it's a relationship with their imagination. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was a but, good rap line you could use. Oh, yeah. yeah. You got a relationship yeah. with your imagination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Relation, imagination. That yeah, it's pretty good. See? We could go somewhere with that. Yeah. Well, um, they're going to get mad at that. So here's what it is. <laughs> um, By the way, our, our rap names are uh, Vanilla Soft Serve and Heavy E. Heavy E? Yeah. I noticed yours is just like a blow. <laughs> so his insulted is like a kind by of, that. <laughs> yeah, his name's like kind of a diss in the name. Why not call him Iron Man? Wait, how's in mind? Wait, not you could be Iron Man. My bad. Fat. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm. I know that's vanilla I'm soft serve. You could be the mighty Thor. Yeah, there's doesn't... there's no diss there. It's uh, oh, it's all instead of the mighty Thor, the whitey Thor. Yeah, <laughs> but he's Tony Stark. Tony could be Stark White. I don't know. Yeah. If he lost some weight, he could be Bony Stark. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> but, uh, oh, <laughs> okay, now he has been insulted. I'm, no, I'm not saying, because I'm saying he's not bony. That's not, not what bony. I mean. I'm, I'm Italian. I eat a lot of pasta. I got my own issues. But so, so Did you just call me fat? <laughs> no, I'm just saying you don't qualify quite to be bony. Yeah, you're not bony. True. You got to do some work to be like, you know, machinist type Machine, of level. Yeah, you know? yeah. Okay, so. What, what are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, where are we? What are they? What are they? I guys? like to use the phrase Hebrew Israelism. Okay. Secular scholars use the phrase Black Israelism, like Jacob S. Dorman. Uh, really, he wrote a really good book on on this topic. Covers some different ground than I cover, but I use Hebrew Israelism because a lot of them just don't like uh, they don't like to be called Black Hebrews. Like they say it's redundant and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I usually put it in quotation marks to denote that it's a contended, a contentious phrase, meaning I don't agree they're Hebrew or Israelites usually. But I say Hebrew Israelism is an idea. But here's the main tenets. Maybe we'll say it's five things, and I'll make them super simple. Okay. We're the Israelites. The Jews are fakes. You got to keep the law. The Christian church gets it wrong. We're going to be on top at the end. That's, just, that's the essence of Hebrew Israelism. Okay. So they believe that we still need to follow the, the Mosaic law? To greater and lesser degrees, yes. Every now and then you'll get one who wants to sound Christian and will start talking about grace, but it's very similar to when Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses start talking about grace. And so uh, the, their main visible signs of keeping the law are where's your fringes at? So fringes on the edge of your shirt. And uh, do you keep the Sabbath? Although, very interesting. It almost seems like by keeping the Sabbath, they just mean don't go to church on Sunday. Because a lot of the groups, if you live in a major metropolitan area, you know what I'm talking about. When do you see them most of the time? On the street corners. When are they at 19th Avenue in Campbellback? When are they at 27th Avenue in Indian School? When are they at Dunlap and 19th? Saturday. They're out there on Saturdays. So imagine your rest being putting your fringes on, carrying a bunch of sandwich boards and PAs, setting up on a corner in a hundred degree weather or whatever, <laughs> grabbing a mic and yelling at people. That's their Sabbath rest. My point is they're not really keeping the Sabbath. Their law keeping is uh, barely law keeping. And when you push them on it, it becomes to the best of our ability, to the best of our ability. You get a lot of that. Well, Yahweh knows we're not in power. Hmm but they don't usually call them Yahweh. They prefer other terms usually. So fringes like uh, that jacket that uh, Jim Carrey's wearing in Dumb and Dumber. Is that in that when he gets rich? Is it like those kind of fringes? Oh yeah, he's got the, the like the, the right hand. <laughs> yeah, like except on the, on the bottom of your shirt. Okay. Bottom of the shirt. And uh, that's considering putting on the garments. Okay. 
And that's a sign that they're keeping a, a law that was given to Israel at a later time. And it's interesting that law shows alterations in the law because the law is given at Mount Sinai and uh, Israel messed up. And later on, Yahweh said, OK, now rock these fringes on the bottom uh, the, uh, with, you know, with the blue border on the, on the bottom of your garments to remember the law. So it was a later thing to help them remember, kind of like tying your, you know, tying a bow around your finger back in the day. Right. And uh, that's one of the key things they, they point to. My point by saying that is the law keeping is decidedly superficial and shallow. Feast of Booths just happened. You're supposed to be outside a full seven days living in a tent that you made with your hands. The guys go to Walmart, spend two hours out in a tent with a Bible study, say we covered it. Or they say, well, back, backyard's not big enough. I can't do it. So the, their leaders say, as long as you put bed sheets over your windows, it's like you're in the tent. So you'll see them do live shows during the Festival of Tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles with bed sheets over their, over their windows because they're keeping, that's how they, that, that, that's them keeping the law. Rare is it a group that actually says, let's go out seven days, keep it for real. And here's what's fascinating. It's one of the pilgrimage feasts. You're supposed to go to Jer Jerusalem or Israel to do it. That's what they would do back in the day. Uh, but of course, they don't, they don't book, you know, you don't see these guys booking tickets. So it's kind of more like Jewish cosplay. Some people accuse them of LARPing. Yeah, LARPing. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Some people accuse them of LARPing. And it's, it's, I think it's evident to most people that, you know, I don't think the priests dressed like that. You know, they'll have like massive uh, m m gold menorah chains on, like House of Israel <laughs> likes to wear those big stars of David with like a Miami Dolphins hat. And then, you know, they'll be rocking some some Nikes underneath. And it's like, I don't think that's what the priest really wore, you know, but but. Uh, so what? I'm oh, sorry, I'm not sure what. They, some saying, of them call themselves priests. Some of them, okay. some of their leaders call themselves priests in the modern era. Saying for context, uh, some of our viewers may, uh, may, maybe one of the main places that you've seen these guys would be on the Covington Kid video, mm -hmm. right? Is that them there, the surrounding them? Yep, that's House of Israel. Okay. I, I uh, have had some back and forth with their leader, uh, Chief Ephraim. Ooh. Is his name Chief Ephraim. So if you're of Ephraim, according to the 12 tribe chart of the one West type of Hebrew Israelites, because just like there's Calvinists and Armenians and everyone knows Calvinists are right. There's one Westers and non one Westers, right? So one Westers are a certain type of Hebrew Israelite. That doesn't mean that's their name. It means they're sort of their theological umbrella. Okay. House of Israel is a one West styled group. And so they have this 12 tribes chart on the 12 tribes chart. It says, if you're Puerto Rican on your father's side, you're of Ephraim. And so he's Puerto Rican on his father's side, ostensibly. So he calls himself Chief Ephraim. And he's the leader of that group that uh, that was kind of the spark that lit the fire with the Covington kids. Mm. That's more complicated than Lord of the Rings. Yeah. <laughs> it becomes difficult. And they constantly accuse me of misrepresenting them. I take great pains to not represent them. And so, you know, I know we talked about fringes and, and, and certain styles of dress and street corners. And so it sounds very exotic and out there. Let's go back and talk about a number that I think is important. The Philos Project, in conjunction with something called Lifeway Research, they last uh, very recently did a, a, a sample size. I think it was a thousand margin of error, less than 4%. African American attitudes towards Israel, right? On there, there's a question about Hebrews like teaching. Do you agree? Disagree, right? Four percent so they agree. Extrapolate that out. Current numbers of folks in the United States self-identified as Black American that equals 1.8 million people who I self-identify as a Hebrews like. Well, there's not 1.4 million out there on a corner. So what else is there? More and more, we see people infiltrating churches and sometimes even churches flipping into Hebrew Israelite churches. Prominent example of that is a group out of straightway or out of Tennessee called straightway under the leadership of pastor Dow it used to just be a kind of a good old fashioned Pentecostal cultic like church, right? I'm not saying Pentecostal groups are cultic, but this one certainly was if you study their history. Well, they eventually turned into a Hebrew Israelite thing. And now Multiple former NFL players are in there. Daniel Muir, Robert Mathis, Kabir from Green Bay. The list goes on and on. 
And uh, Sports Illustrated even did a three-part article, I think, last year where they interviewed me for some of it on Kabir, Charles Dow and all this because it popped up in the news when Kabir, uh, there was this kerfuffle in Wisconsin about his children being at a Christmas play and he didn't want it. And two of the guys from straightway got arrested because they carried guns into the church and didn't leave when they were asked to leave. It's a whole thing. But if you look at the two guys who got arrested, they were both white guys because this group accepts black and white. And uh, if you saw them, you may not know these are Hebrew Israelites. They're diverse. So some people are like, hey, look, they're diverse. They can't be that bad. I always tell them, since when does diversity equal orthodoxy? I'm sure the early Gnostics were plenty or, or <laughs> diverse. Jehovah's Witnesses still are. What are you talking about? Problem is people have such a uh, this kind of vision in their mind of Hebrews is like just being bizarre and only like racially exclusive that they see something different. They're caught off guard. But more and more, it's changing into preachers in the pulpit who wear suits and espouse Hebrew Islamism like Omar Thabu or Stephen Darby uh, mm-hmm. look like traditional churches. But next thing you know, they're talking about the 400 year prophecy, 619 to 2019, supposedly. So it is mainstreaming more and more. And that's why you see Bill Cosby tweeting out to Hebrew Israelite leaders. I have this in a recent talk I did that actually just got uploaded today. So just look up Vocab Malone workshop and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. And uh, you have Nick Cannon not saying he's a Hebrew Israelite, but espousing elements of Hebrew Israelism. Ice Cube retweeting IUIC, which is one of the groups, Israel United in Christ. So it's really becoming more tenable to people to believe these tenets of Hebrew Israelism than ever was before. So what's the big draw? Like, Why, why are people, is it, does it have this kind of authentic feel to it? Or is it, I don't know. I don't, what, what is it, the few things okay. you see in justice you want justice so does it link is it linked kind of to so the social justice movement or is it not or where does it fall into that whole movement and you know black lives matter and all that stuff most of the groups are pretty anti-black lives matter because they mm-hmm. view it as a feminist movement designed to destroy the black family okay so most of them are against so they can be correct sometimes yeah yeah actually <laughs> these guys you'd be surprised how politically conservative a lot of them are mm. and not afraid to say it they're kind of used to being outcasts so they'll they'll say what's what as far as that goes but a lot of them don't believe in voting anyway so mm. um so here's what here's what you got i vote you see injustice you want justice but a lot of these guys desire for justice turns into just bloodthirsty revenge and that's why you'll sometimes go to like the isupk website and Whoa. see pictures of people in the future holding up decapitated you know edomites which mean decapitated heads of white people or something and uh you have that's out there that's crazy well yeah i mean isupk is one of the main groups you just go to the website look at the 12 tribes chart art and they have uh plenty of that going on there was a blog he was a cartoonist and he had all kinds of stuff with portrayals of sexual slaves in the kingdom and and decapitated people and heads and eyeballs in jars this is hebrews like kind of like fantasy uh art you know this is what's going to happen in the future and uh we went after a, on a live stream they took it down hmm. the, the hebrews lights took down i don't mean blog spot or whatever mm-hmm. took it down because they were like oh you know this makes us look bad i guess <laughs> but but again not all of them believe in that kind of revenge fantasy but the idea that this is the way that God is going to make things are right. People have to pay for what they've done in the past. And uh, Hebrew Israelism has an eschatology that to a greater or lesser degree has the people who are responsible for, for great many injustices. They end up paying in this system. But in Christianity, it looks like everyone just gets forgiven. But uh, that doesn't seem fair to us. And so Hebrew Israelism's eschatology is very attractive to people. Also, everybody asks, who am I? It can be more acute, though, depending on what's going on in your world and and all those kinds of things. And so uh, the more acute it is, uh, the more pressing a a question it is, who am I? Where am I from? And so uh, this says, oh, you don't you don't know your history. Well, actually, uh, open this book right here. And this is the history of your people. So you're reading about your forefathers. Literally, you're reading about your four four uh, foremothers. Literally, oh, now I know who I am. So that's great. I'm my people are in the center of the Bible. Uh, that's fantastic. So that also they feel like the Christian church has failed them, and that's confirmed every time a Christian 
uh, comes up to them on the street and the Hebrews lights are able to theologically slice and dice them with ease. And it's totally confirmed. These people know nothing. Their pastors know nothing. They're leaderless. They're not good for our community. They don't know the Bible. Uh, thank God that I joined this thing because these people literally know nothing. That's how they look at the Christian church. That's why it's difficult to witness to them a lot of times because they feel you have nothing to tell them. You have nothing to say that I'm going to learn from you, but I can teach you if you'd like. So, I'm, so looking, some of the, I'm, looking, some of the I'm looking at a chart of the 12 tribes of Israel from one of these mm -hmm. groups. So, Ethan, you're a Native American, right? Do you have some Native American? 32nd, I think. So, you are the tribe of Gad. Gad? No, it has to be on your father's side. Oh, it is. Is it your father's side? Father's side. It had to be, it have, you'd have to be able to trace it back to father's side all the way. It couldn't be your father's mother. It had to be your father's father and on back to how far you had to go back. That I'm not sure. I think it might oh. be mother. I'm not sure. Sorry, but they so, would. They would. They, really, uh, I think, really disappointed right now. <laughs> yeah, you're not in Gad. Sad. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, what are, sad. We Patrick, said, what race are you? Called out Gad. Sad on accident. You have a little Native American. Don't How far outside. back does it go, Don't Father? No. Okay. All right. Well, none of us are in the twelve tribes. Is the FBI Yeah, the House of us? Israel. House of Israel actually called. Uh, that was the group that debated with the Covington kids, or whatever you want to say they did. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, debated, when yeah. some of the people came up to them who were at the indigenous uh, day in March, that's why there were people were there from. There's pro life community and the uh, indigenous people's march. So the Hebrews lights were there for the indigenous people. They didn't even know about the pro life thing. That was sort of just the fates aligned. And so uh, whenever someone who looked white came up to them and said, "Well, I'm Native American. That's why I'm here," they would say, "Oh, you're a." They would, I, th I forget what the term is, a $5 or five nickel Indian. They use some term that basically means uh, all white people saying that they're Native Americans. Mm. So that they have a term for it. And any, it, was, it was interesting and incredibly racist. Any Native American who disagreed with them, they would say, instead of you're an Uncle Tom, they would say you're an Uncle Tomahawk. Whoa, smart. That was that's their thing. Pretty good. Like, words, that's fun. It's one of those things where you respect the diss, you know. Yeah. Aren't like, they kind uh, of yeah. like a five dollar Israelite though? Because they're not really from Israel much. Well, they would say that Esau knows the truth about us and mm -hmm. archaeology, history, linguistics, and even genetics. Sometimes, sometimes I'll bring that into the fray. Although a lot of them don't. Uh, backs up our claims in the Bible. And if we're not the people of this book, who are the people of the book? Hmm. They'll say something like so that. So, kind of to me, the the appeal sounds very much like a lot of cults, where you have this secret knowledge that nobody else has ever discovered, and you guys are the ones who know it. Like you're on, you're in this in club of people with a secret link to the past, and hey, like the they video would, game link to the past. Yeah, they would claim, they would claim that uh, there's always been a remnant of Israelites who knew who they were, and but Esau has went to great lengths. Esau is a sense of of. of they this sometimes use Esau to, to basically as a, as a nickname for all white men or something. Esau has covered it up, and so this is a fulfillment of a prophecy from Jeremiah that says you'll uh, you know be discontinued or cut off from your heritage. And they'll say, "Look, see, it says we're going to forget who we were." Although, if you look at that passage, it's saying they're going to be cut off from their land. That's what that's literally what the passage means. You can read it in context. I think it's Jeremiah seventeen four, and you can look, and they'll sometimes use that, and some other ones will say this means we're going to forget who we were. But uh, that has to do with being cut off from the land, right? Cut off from your inheritance, some translations will say. And uh, really what this is, is it's a restorationist movement. So you have the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, and there's other groups. Those are most prominent. They're both uh, categorized by scholars of religion as restorationist movements. The basic idea is there was a great falling away, some kind of an apostasy, which they would say is predicted in the Pauline epistles. And during that time, people lost the essence of the gospel. So for the Mormons, obviously, that's something different. You know, you lost a priesthood. For Jehovah's Witnesses, that's something else. You lost God's sacred name, his divine name. Hebrew Israelites, it's something else. It's you lost who the true people are. You lost who the people are, this book. So Hebrew Israelism is a restorationist movement. And I don't think it's accidental that its birthday essentially comes on the tail end of when restorationism was popular. And I even came in Protestant circles, people saying, we're, we're not just Baptists, we're primitive Baptists. The idea was that we're going all the way back to John the Baptist type of thing, you know? And so uh, Hebrew Israelism started the same way. Two different men, unclear exactly who was first, usually it's uh, described as William S. Crowley, another man of F.S. Cherry, Frank S. Cherry. Both of them 
within short span of time, claim to have visions from God revealing they and black Americans were the actual true lost Israelites. And uh, so you could say the birthplace of, of Hebrew Israelism was 129 years ago in a field in Guthrie, Oklahoma, if William S. Craddy was the first one, which it seems he was. They'll say, well, that's not the beginning, but they can't point Hebrew Israelites to any other person making that explicit claim that basically if you came over here on a ship, you're an Israelite. That's the essence of a lot of times what they say Hebrew Israelism is. And they get that from Deuteronomy 2868, which if you remember the law, here's the law at the end, God says, now do it. And if you do, here's some promises that are nice, they'll happen. But if you don't, here's some curses that are going to happen. And Deuteronomy 28 are the curses for disobedience. And at the end, it says, you're going to go back in Egypt to ships. And then you're going to be sold or sell yourselves, depending on translation, as slaves. And so they say that the, was fulfilled on the transatlantic slave trade, Deuteronomy 2868. So it's kind of like their John 316. It's their good news verse, if you will. Because if that applies to you, you get the golden ticket. Okay. I understood some of those words. <laughs> Well, ask away. <laughs> ask away. I want people to understand this. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> you guys do satire, so I'm trying to have some fun, but I have to relate in all seriousness the seriousness of this issue because it doesn't just grab people that maybe if you're hearing this for the first time, not you, I know you guys are more enlightened, mm -hmm. where you people might brush it off and say, oh, no one would take that serious. We don't have to, don't have to worry about that. Now, imagine being a pastor in New York. When you first heard about Joseph Smith, this guy says he was visited by the spirit of a lost Israelite who lived at the Americas named Moroni, and he came to the foot of his bed and told him to dig in a hill in New York to find some golden plates written in a reformed Egyptian that would be a record of the lost tribes of Israel and Jesus' visitation to the Americas. No one's going to believe that. <laughs> <laughs> and Joseph Smith is farm boy. He's the prophet to lead, to lead the church in the latter. No one's going to believe that. Now there's BYU. You see, you see what I'm saying? So like that, it's important to take these things seriously. Everything doesn't become Mormonism, right? We understand that. Hebrewism is showing massive signs of growth and shows a great ability to infiltrate and have people adopt tenets just enough to distort the gospel even if they don't become full on out donning the fringes. And I think that's very important for people to understand. And again, it's not just one type of person because some of the groups say, Hey, you may not be an Israelite like me, but you can be grafted in as long as you know your place. God's a God of order, right? And in his order, Judahites are the teachers over Israel. You other nations can teach other nations under our authority. You'll be grafted in through us. It's all good. You're my brother. Just know your place. My point is there's people that are, that are with that. You know, they're down with that. And other ones say, well, you name might not be a physical Israelite like us, but you can kind of be like a spiritualist like, so we're all good. And so a lot of these things are attracted to people. And guess what? hundred years before the birth of black Israelism, something called Anglo-Israelism. Some people know about that. And it basically had the same tenets and was extremely popular in England. And eventually over to the Americas, it's kind of died out, but the Christian identity folks and actually the KKK still embrace a version of Anglo-Israelism. And every now and then you'll find people like some of the followers from the Worldwide Church of God, you know, Herbert Armstrong and all those guys. He was he was spitting Anglo-Israelism for years on the radio. And so if we're like, oh, you must be, you know, something's wrong with you. Well, there's lots of Americans who believe this. And that's why you can find a lot of countercult books by evangelical apologists from the early 20th century against Anglo-Israelism because it was a massive problem then. Now we're dealing with Hebrewism and it's becoming a problem as well. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he has just So mm. oh. let's role play. Kyle is a young black man. No. Use your imagination. <laughs> or not. Or whatever he is. And he's thinking about joining this church. And uh, you guys are hanging out. And he's like, hey, I'm thinking about joining this uh, Israelism church. And, uh, you know, what do you like about it so much, Kyle? Um. And then you got to you got to spit yeah. at him and convince him not to. And then I'm the oh. other guy that's there. You're just watching. <laughs> I could be popcorn. trying to convert him. Yeah. Hey, oh, Mr. Okay. Malone, how you doing? That's a fist bump. 
Don't talk to this guy. Uh, yeah, actually, I would say that. No, no, we're not listening to you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to join the Hebrew Israelites. They're telling me that I'm uh, the chosen people. Why are you telling a random guy this? Wait, I thought... We're I, friends. I, you want, oh, okay. Sorry, we're still in character. So, uh, you believe that uh, you fulfill the curses laid out in Deuteronomy 28, and that's how you know you're an Israelite? What, what is that? He's trying to trick you. No. That, that's what you, you'd have to say. You'd have to say yes to that. Yes. <laughs> Don't say yes. You can't control me, man. You can't tell me what to say. Well, did you know that if you're in Christ, you're free from the curse? Um, Let me read something to you real quick. Galatians chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 11. Now, it is evident that no one is justified before God by law, by the law. There's another conversation we probably need to have. For the righteous shall live by faith, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Here's the thing you really need to listen to, Kyle, or whatever your name is. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Didn't Jesus Christ hang on a tree? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he took upon the sins of sinners in that exchange, and he gives us his righteousness, and he takes on our sin. So if you're in Christ, you don't want to try to find some curses that you fulfill and hang on to those. And in fact, the curse for not doing the law is no longer on you if you're in Christ. Now, let's look at the last verse real quick. It's important. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. If you go back, I know you know your Old Testament. Remember when God came to Abraham and he said, hey, I'm going to bless you, give you lots of kids and stuff make you a great nation so you can bless all the families of the earth. So Jesus came not just to bless Israel, Kyle, but to bless all the nations of the earth. And that's a, literally what Paul's saying here. So that in Christ Jesus, you got to be in Christ. Being in Abraham is not as important as being in Christ. The blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So whether you're Jew or Gentile, you can get it. And let me just share one other verse. Should I keep Relation listening three. to this guy? I've been... share, share one other verse and then I'll let you speak. This is one other verse. <laughs> this guy won't this stop. says that if you have faith in Christ, you are to be identified as a son of Abraham. So you don't have to look at a chart. You don't have to look at even your genetics. You don't have to look at curses fulfilled or not fulfilled. You need to look at Galatians 3, 7. Knowing that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So who is a son of Abraham? Biblically speaking, those who have faith in Christ. That's what you need. So Kyle, is it more important to be in Christ or to be in Abraham? Well, but these guys have cool charts. <laughs> if you're in Christ, you're in Abraham. So with Christ, you get Abraham and the blessings of Abraham. And he's your father because you are following the example of faith laid out. So I'm going to pray for you. And I pray that you go home and read Galatians 3 away from those other guys. Hey. That guy in the flannel next to you. What do you, what? And I pray the spirit moves on you and you can see the truth. But these guys have cool fringes on their shirts. You can still wear fringes if you want. Oh. Just don't make them binding on anyone else's conscience. All right. I'm sold. Me too. I'm in. I'm in. All as right. As long as well. I can still wear the fringes. You can. You certainly can. <laughs> so your name is Vocab Malone, which yeah, when I right. first heard that, I thought that sounds like a uh, TV show about a detective for kids that introduces new words to them that they'd never heard before. I'm totally with that hey, idea. Kids, Someone sign me up. It's me, Vocab Malone. Have you ever heard the word <laughs> telekinesis? I'm, I'm with that. So I was thinking we could play a quick game with you. Oh boy. We will I'm throw, gonna we're going to throw brand new words at you. Okay. I'm supposed to not and touch you, the computer screen. So you come up with a vocabulary, a word, a definition for this word. So, Kyle, you can read from the list that I came up with, and I'll, I'll read from uh, one of our friends here, a writer named Ehrlich, has a, uh, a Twitter account called New Words, and he makes up new words. And he has definitions, but I want to see how close you come. All right, let's do it, man. Lugus. Spelled Lugus. Lugus, yeah. L-U-G-U-S. That means a state of great chagrin. 
Can you use, create a, uh, do an example sentence? Like use when he sentence. saw the planet's ruin, he is filled with Lugas. <laughs> Sounds gross. <laughs> Uh, in, in the new words, it was uh, accidentally stealing art from the Louvre. Oh, okay. So Da Vinci Code stuff. Okay. okay and the example sense is, sure, I've Lugas 16 times, but only once on purpose. Sounds like a guy I know. Um, Poffition. P-O-F-F-I-T-I-O-N. Poffition. Poffition means to do things in an extremely expeditious manner. Use it in a sentence, please. He painted the house with much proficient. <laughs> <laughs> You're living up to your name, vocab. Yeah. <laughs> Malone. Um, proficient is actually an invitation to mud. <laughs> <laughs> What's the sentence for that one? Uh, clean wipe, everyday wipes, work against grease, build up smudges, and the profession we all succumb to. <laughs> I kind of. Right. How about this one? Neo Skizzle. <laughs> Neo Skizzle is a brand new genre of hip hop, primarily primarily performed by bisexual millennials. <laughs> <laughs> Can you use it in a sentence, please? Yeah. I turned on uh, YouTube the other day and saw nothing but a bunch of Neo Skizzle. <laughs> So my definition I came up with for that one is very similar. A style of slam poetry that pertains only to insects native to Russia. <laughs> I'm with that. The coffee shop had a neo-schizzle night that was exhilarating. I used to do slam poetry. I was in some interesting circles. That's why I put that in there. It's a little that slam poetry. TV is VD in color 3D. It's a vision disease telling lies to me. You can ABC, NBC, and CBS get it, CBS, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, like that. I like when they do the raise the eyebrow and they yeah, yeah, yeah. throw the little zinger. And then I zinger. looked one last time in his eye and saw my hands were covered in blood, you know. <laughs> and they started doing things with it. Real that wasn't hits. my style, but that was oh, some guy's style. Okay. Yeah. Bolteron. B-U-L-T-E-R-O-N. <laughs> Well, or maybe Bolteron is a, is a proper noun, mm -hmm. and it has now been discovered to be the 10th planet in our solar system. Okay. Using a sentence. We lost Pluto, but we got Bolteron. <laughs> <laughs> the actual, well, actually, if it's 10, it'd be... Anyways, yeah. The actual made-up so. definition is a chandelier that has killed someone. <laughs> An alternate <laughs> definition is when a person thinks they've gotten away with their scheme only to be stopped by a chandelier. <laughs> That's a real thing. That's a real trope in a lot of movies. What's yeah. the sentence? Why is this four bedroom house so cheap? Is there a bolter on or something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so one more each. One more, yeah. For each. Claster. Claster. Claster is a substance made from a new organic compound out of a lab in China. Mm. Using a sentence. We thought it was Wuhan, but it was just cluster. <laughs> <laughs> My definition was uh, a group of people who do not realize they all wore the same brand of underwear simultaneously within a five mile radius. Sounds like someone had a bad experience. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of steps to, to uncover that fact. The, the largest cluster in the United States was in uh, Bennett, Colorado. So that'd be a cl instead of a, he could have a, a cluster. cluster up. Yeah. Or but nobody ever knows they exist because nobody knows what underwear everybody else is wearing. Well, that's what I'm saying, though. So, uh, there'd be multiple bad steps that would happen to. You couldn't prove it. Well, it happened at least once. Maybe. Perhaps Superman was involved. That would be a fascinating experience. Go around and they just have everybody check their underwear brand. And see when how many plasters you can find. <laughs> couldn't happen to me because I, I strictly buy Star Wars underwear. They do make them in 2XL. Oh, see, we probably already got a plaster because I'm sure Kyle has the same pair. Hopefully not the same. <laughs> <laughs> I should have clicked on this Twitter account before this because I'm cracking up at every single one of these. <laughs> All right, what, last one. Dipterod. D-I-P-T-E-R-O-D. Dipterod. That is also a proper noun. It's from a ancient king of a people who resided in the Levant area 
who we've just now discovered, although we only have one artifact from them, mm. which is a clay pot, and their king was Dipterod. <laughs> Dictorod. You know, because it was dedicated to King Dictorod. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can we use that in a sentence? <laughs> King Dictorod is way better than King Nimrod. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the actual made up definition is an executioner mask with the eye holes not yet cut out. <laughs> the, se the sentence is. <laughs> that sounds like a paper bag. It's using a sentence. Honey, please don't keep the potatoes in my Dictorod. <laughs> Uh, if that, you want more of those new words, you can go to new, at new words 13 on Twitter. It's a tiny Twitter account our buddy started up a while back. He's probably going to be shocked to see followers suddenly pop up on there. Just follow it. <laughs> this That's reminds me, though. Hilarious. I used to work at a radio station, and I did this show called Urban Theologian Radio. And the guy after me was like this super smart guy. And he did like political talk, you know, Seth something or other. I can't remember his name. And he always took somewhat of an, he didn't know me, but we, his show was after mine. So he was always basically trying to kick me out of the studio. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, he always took mild umbrage that I was called vocab. So mm -hmm. every time he came in like vocab, huh? Well, <laughs> let's see this. And he would spit these words and I never knew what any of them meant. <laughs> and then I would look them up and find out all these words. This guy was throwing at me were real words. I was like, how does this guy know all this stuff? I was just like a total idiot from any, for in front of any guest that I ever had. Because this guy, Seth, would come in and throw like two or three words while I was packing up. Like, I, and he would use it in a sentence and everything. And they were real words, this guy. Hmm. One of these guys that, that just reads the dictionary. I don't know. It's a true Casually. story, though. Yeah. And I remember thinking, I never would have gathered he was this smart just from listening to his radio show. Hmm. Hmm. So can we bring this home and attempt a, so I don't think we need to compete doing a slam poetry off. I think what we can do mm -hmm. is a, a collaborative slam poetry freestyle. Okay. Once a guy is getting a little hung up, someone else tag in. Okay. Uh, just as long as you got to get hung over, but okay. I'll pass. Okay. What? I'll be the moderator. I'll pass. I'll be the moderator. Yeah, there's pass nothing, the, there's wait, that was greater. the first line. Okay, yeah, go ahead. first line. He pass thinks the microphone. He can get out I'm the moderator. There's nothing greater than when you're grating cheese like an alligator. Because every time you see a blown up woman, you deflate her. I was looking at the moon. It's full of craters. Don't be a hater. That coach just, just got like fired AC from Slater. the Raiders. Put on your seatbelt. Make. Click, click. <laughs> <laughs> He'll smile, Mr. Nader. If you study the life of Muhammad, he was a worse father than Darth Vader. Don't know if he breathed as heavy. The other day, I threw a Ford over the levee, not a Chevy. Mm. My name is E, comma, heavy. Every time I go to the bevy, my, flav my flavor is... I, I, help, help somebody. Kyle. Uh, Fla heavy. Your flavor is stupendous, tremendous, oh, you can do something incredible, new. edible, indelible. Not invisible, but indivisible. You are an individual who's a lyrical, miracle, spiritual, intellectual, but very effectual. And you have to be contextual because every time you f talk to a homosexual, <laughs> you should be reflectual. Yeah. Fr free but hopefully not in the sense of genuflect because I'd be like, what the heck? Check your neck like Wu-Tang. You Bang! When you spit lyrics, Kyle, you got an ill freestyle. So sick, it might have been from the Nile, a virus. I see your iris and realize you're the illest. So I say you get the top bill. Wuhan, Kid. clan, <laughs> Wu-Tang, fat sandwich, Kraken, <laughs> crack sandwich. I ate Release one in the hood. It. Grease it, crease it like a cholo. Every time I turn on the Babylon Bee, I say, oh, no. <laughs> Let's uh, get some Froyo. There was a man with a tat on his big fat belly. <laughs> it wiggled around like marmalade jelly. Whoa. He's, he's quoting DC talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's called biting when you're reciting <laughs> someone else's lyrics. I'm inviting you to a battle. You're a baby. So I'll. Swaddle. Scare you with a rattle? <laughs> Swaddle. Here's your rattle. 
Swaddle, you give you a rattle. Because I think you're about to tattle. All right, I think we, we, we killed that. We killed that. Yeah, you guys definitely killed something. <laughs> we killed that like Muhammad did poets. This is the end. Don't you know it? <laughs> you got to have a good ending. Nice job. All right. We'll add that to our album. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to move into our subscriber lounge where you yeah. will get more. I think we should get it. We want some that. street apologetic s- stories. We're Not like, I don't want them like, oh, he thought this Bible verse was true, but I had this I got Bible a good verse. One. I want ones where you're like, oh, I forgot my pants fell down or uh, I got punched by this hooker or something crazy. I don't got quite that, but I got one where I punched a hooker. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I do, that, got, I do got one. I do one got up. one, though. Okay. We're so gonna get this is my stores. favorite. Hold on. This is my favorite one the, of all time. Oh, not yet. Oh, he's, okay. Oh, not yet. Okay. Join not us. Yet. Click join or subscribe. You can hear the crazy hooker punching story. <laughs> and here we go. Coming up next for Babylon B subscribers. Have you ever, uh, like, converted anybody out of that? What's that like? You can get them no, integrated. Holy, into... I haven't, but the Holy Spirit has. Oh, good you answer. you just, like, one-up me? Right, fine. Which Ninja Turtle are you? But I always like clearly the guy you know your ninja time. turtles from behind you. So you saved them. Good job. Yeah. Yes, Charles Finney, I did. <laughs> Enjoying this hard-hitting interview? Become a Babylon Bee subscriber to hear the rest of this conversation. Go to babylonbee.com slash plans for full-length ad-free podcasts. Kyle and Ethan would like to thank Seth Dillon for paying the bills, Adam Ford for creating their job, the other writers for tirelessly pitching headlines, the subscribers, and you, the listener. Until next time, this is Dave D'Andrea, the voice of the Babylon Bee, 